Christ. Amen. Please be seated. For a pastor, there is something very special about coming back to the church where you were baptized and confirmed. All of your children baptized as well. I was even told the Trinity was looking forward to welcoming us home today. And to be sure, wherever I go, I will always consider myself to be a child of Trinity Christian Church in Toledo, Ohio. So I can appreciate it when the Jews basically want to tell Jesus to step off. When he offends their family of faith by calling them slaves, owned by something false. Are we not the fulfillment of the prophecy? Our faith going all the way back to our father Abraham. How can you say we are enslaved by evil? But how quickly the descendants of Abraham forget. How quickly they forget the toil and misery under the taskmaster's whip in Egypt slaying of their children when they prospered. How quickly the descendants of Abraham forget their suffering and exile into a foreign land. A few scattered survivors in prison in Babylonia. Even in the midst of it, the proud descendants of Abraham failed to recognize their bondage to the will of Roman rulers, imprisoned, fined, Still, each and every time the rebellious descendants of Abraham found themselves trapped, God provided them with the deliverer. And yet, how quickly we forget our need for deliverance. Because here Jesus stands before us, descendants of Abraham, this very morning as he reminds us, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. We all commit sin, and now that sin owns us, Jesus says. No matter how wealthy you are, or if you were raised in the church, everyone who sins is a slave and will not live in the house forever. Yet Pharaoh's kings and Caesars that have enslaved God's people are cupcakes compared to the enemy that Jesus is speaking of. Under God's judgment, we find ourselves enslaved by the ultimate, eternal taskmaster who we call Satan. You thought you knew pestilence and famine, but it's nothing compared to starving and thirsting for love and mercy. You thought you knew cruelty and sickness and disease, but it's nothing compared to this eternal suffering and death that Jesus warns of. You thought you knew toil and misery, but it is nothing compared to this yoke of guilt and shame. Every failure, another pound added to your ball and chain. You thought you knew what it was to be scattered, scattered and exiled. But now, forever in bondage, to the will of an oppressor like no other, would be cut off. What do we do? What do we do, my fellow exiles and slaves, who would take nothing short of perfection to earn our freedom? And here God looks right into our hearts and he sees our every sin. Every sin that possesses us and keeps us in prison. So seeing that we are helpless then, there is only one thing left to do. Turn back to God, repent, and pray for a deliverer. God, our Father, hears our cry for help. And he will send his one and only Son to be 
be our servant, who alone can deliver us. A son who will live the perfect life on our behalf, where we have not. A son who alone who will withstand the temptation to sin, starving in the wilderness. A son who is struck and oppressed, destroyed and forsaken, because he is the son who alone can become slave to the sin of the world. When he owns our sins on that cross so that we would be free. On the cross, Jesus Christ broke the bond of slavery. He tore the chains of death that held us. He purchased us and he redeemed us from this very taskmaster in his own body and blood that he gives to set us eternally free. So my brothers and sisters in Christ, what is it that has a hold on you? What is it that oppresses you day and night? What is it that leaves you feeling trapped and boxed in because in Christ, on this very day, you are released? Freely, and with no strings attached. This kind of freedom sounds too good to be true, as we remember the Reformation. This kind of pure grace surely seems foreign to us, like an inmate who can't adjust outside the prison walls. Now the greatest temptation that the descendants of Abraham will face is to go back to Egypt. Especially on the journey to the promised land when the cross is there. Humility, sacrifice, dying to ourselves, relying solely on God, the comforts of Egypt can be so attractive. Can we really trust people with this kind of freedom that the gospel gives? <clears throat> See, they got a lot more work done in Egypt. Maybe if we just strap the yoke of the law on a little bit, we'll have real disciples. So go on and crack the whip. Get them to go to the next level of discipleship or stewardship or missions or devotion or whatever else. Put them back on that path to perfection, control of our own destiny. And there we go, right back into the despair of slavery, never able to live up to the perfection, forced to put on an act, while the yoke gets larger and the ball and chain gets heavier and heavier until we finally collapse under the oppression. <coughs> Martin Luther knew how that felt. Toiling day and night to attain a righteousness that would set him free, but it only led to hopelessness. So why does this man, Martin Luther, stand before an empire, willing to lose his life over a disagreement with the church that's just trying to increase discipleship. Because he had tasted freedom. He had been to the promised land of milk and honey, and he wasn't going back. Being Lutheran, then, is not just a family heritage. It is to stand on the very word of God and our freedom that it gives. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Not just sort of free, and now you finish things with your choices and the power of your will. <coughs> free yourself through some spiritual growth techniques. We are talking completely free all the way right now by grace through faith. The good news of the truth of Jesus Christ
Christ has released us from everything that would hold us in bondage. Our deepest, darkest sins, our doubts, our fears, the tomb, cancer. Because we live in God's word and we are transformed to our very souls. We have walked on dry ground through the parted sea of baptism, sprinkled with the very mercy and forgiveness in the word of God, as the walls of water came crashing down upon the enemy that would try to keep us from the promised land. We live in God's word as we step in the promised land here today at the altar of God. Set free from all of our burdens as we partake of the milk of Christ's blood and the honey of his own flesh. We celebrate our freedom at the feast of the Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the whole world, the sins which would try to hold us in bondage and enslave us. We exiles from every corner of the earth are free to gather back together at the Father's table on this very morning. So welcome, welcome to the promised land, my brothers and sisters, Trinity Lutheran Church. There is nothing that can bind us to our descendants of Abraham, who possess the same gift of faith and this deliverance who sets us free. Today we leave our shackles in Egypt where they belong. We let the ball and chain cover over in the sands of Babylon. Because our yoke has been grounded, plowed into the ground of Golgotha. We are slaves no more, but sons and daughters who remain in the house forever. And we have the inheritance of the kingdom of God that will never be taken from us. Why? Because if the Son, the Son, sets you free, you will be free. Now may the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, your deliverer. At this time, I invite you to kneel as we go before the Lord in prayer. Beloved, rejoicing in the eternal gospel of salvation and its message of life and hope. Let us pray for ourselves, for the church in every place, and for the confession of the truth of God's word throughout the entire world. O God of grace and glory, we give you thanks for the comfort of the gospel restored to your church on earth through the work of Martin Luther and other faithful pastors and leaders during the Reformation. We praise you that by your rich grace we have come to the sure knowledge that we stand just.